Uh, hello and welcome to church this morning. It's so great that you can join us online. Uh, I'm really excited today as we start our new series uh, looking at the book of Ruth. Uh, it is going to be a great few weeks as we look at this uh, book together. Uh, just before we start, I've been uh, really encouraged over the last week about the importance of meeting together and uh, how even in this time it is such an important thing to do even more than ever um, and I would really love to encourage us all uh, today as we think about the service and then afterwards to just really spend time in a community even though we are online. Uh, we're going to start now with our first song which is This Life I Live. Stand where you are. Let's sing together. This life I live is not my own. Welcome again as we uh, have just finished our first song. My name's Matt. I'm the student minister here and it is great to have you uh, with us today. Just a few uh, announcements before we really get going. Uh, firstly, as you can see, obviously you're online so you know that uh, we are streaming. Uh, you can stream our service over Facebook or via YouTube. Uh, just type in South Sydney Anglican Church. Uh, these will be live and you can also watch them later on if you missed it. Um, Another important thing, even though we're online, we still are having community groups. Uh, the best way to watch these and be involved is to get onto Zoom, so download the app um, and then join one of our groups. If you want more information about joining one of our community groups, please contact uh, Matt or myself. Uh, and on Zoom, we also have our morning tea following the service. Uh, you can see the ID code there on screen. Uh, please get on that with us after the service. Um, even though we are online, it is still really important uh, for members of our uh, congregation to uh, help contribute to our church to keep the ministry going. Um, if that is something you would like to do, um, please look at giving online. Uh, we now have uh, Matt coming up to introduce some important uh, announcements as well.
Hi everyone, great to be uh, with you ag again this Sunday. Uh, thank you for joining with us. I just wanted to give a big shout, a big thank you to you all first. Um, I've been sort of asking people to continue giving while church has been in this strange stage and I want to thank everyone who has actually done that. Uh, so many of you have actually brought your offertory online that we had our best month this year in March. So our offertory came in at something like 7,500, which I just want to thank God for, I want to thank you for. We're still aiming to get to about 8,300 a month. That's our, our budget, but we did so much better than we imagined. So thank you all for continuing to support the church during this time. One other thing I just want to quickly bring to your attention, and this is kind of a legal matter, so you can see a thing on the screen you don't need to read it too much. Um, what's happening at the moment is our church is applying to the diocese for a special tax exemption for seven years. Uh, one of the things the Anglican Diocese does is they, they apply a small tax to our property income and they then use that tax money to help plant other churches in other parts of Sydney. And normally that is a fantastic thing. We're behind supporting that because we want to see new churches planted. But here's the issue. We've recently discovered that we have, oh, we've kind of known it for a while, but it's got worse. Our church is in a bad state of uh, disrepair. Uh, there is some significant settling issues happening because we're losing mortar between the bricks in the building. And we've discovered there's going to be a very, very significant cost in fixing and stabilising our building. It's either going to be high six figures or low seven figures. And so what we're doing is asking for the diocese support, not tax our property income, but allow us to get on top of our property maintenance and fix that. And what we're doing at the moment, um, it's going forward in May, is we're asking the diocese for this support. And because it's going against normal protocol and because we're asking to access significant lumps of money to fix the church, uh, it is my responsibility to inform you, the church, that this is happening so that if you have any questions, you can ask myself, you can ask the wardens. Then if you're not satisfied with the answers, you can actually write to the diocese and express your concerns about this course of action. I can't imagine that will be necessary. I'm sure you can come and talk to us. But please see that on the screen right now. I will have also sent you an email by today, later today, giving you details of what's happening and giving you a copy, copy of the ordinance that is going to the diocese. So have a look at the email, read the ordinance, and if you have any questions, any concerns, raise it with myself or one of the other parish councillors or wardens. So thank you. That's all for now. And I think we're going to go over to the Bible reading. Um, I'll ask Peter Boyce to come and bring us the first Bible reading. Thank you. I'll be reading from the book of Ruth, chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Marlon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness 
as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Well, morning, friends and visitors. Uh, my name is Pastor Matt Johnson, and today we're beginning a new sermon series looking at the book of Ruth. Uh, this is a wonderful story of hope for the hopeless. It's about a wedding for a widow. It's about redemption for the irredeemable. And best of all, it's about God's amazing love for Jews and Gentiles alike. So please pray with me today as we begin to look at the book of Ruth. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that your entire word has been written to be a light to our path, to give us a knowledge of you. We thank you for the books in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And Lord, we pray that you give us insight into this book. We pray that even though it is in the Old Testament, that we'll understand it in light of Jesus and what he has done for us. Lord, please help us as we read and study this wonderful story of Ruth. But better yet, Lord, help us to apply it to our own lives in a good and right way. We ask this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' glory. Amen. Amen. Friends, um, as you can see on your screen at the moment, I hope, you can see the Redeeming Ruth image. Can you all see that at home? There's the Redeeming Ruth image. Um, I've chosen this image because uh, the book we're studying is really uh, about Ruth and her redemption, and so I've called it Redeeming Ruth. But here's the thing, I could have equally called it Redeeming Naomi. You see, it's not just 
aren't Gentiles like Ruth who need redeeming. It's actually Jews like Naomi that need redeeming as well. And although this book begins by focusing on Ruth, the Gentiles' redemption, it actually finishes by focusing on uh, Naomi, the Jews' redemption. So whether you're Jew or Gentile, uh, this is an absolutely fantastic book uh, for us to get into and learn from. You see, Naomi was a little bit of a prodigal daughter. Uh, you all know Jesus' parable in the New Testament about the parable, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Um, the son gets his father's inheritance. He then goes away for a distant land and he squanders everything he has. And as he's in the slops feeding the proverbial pigs, he kind of goes, how did I get here? What's happened? What's this mess that I've got myself into? I don't know if you've ever felt like that yourself, that you've made some bad decisions and got yourself into some pretty serious mess. I myself was a bit of a prodigal son. Uh, I grew up Christian home, moved away to Newcastle, squandered all my spiritual blessings, and I ended up actually addicted to drugs, feeding the proverbial pigs, if you like. Uh, I wouldn't say that I was quite suicidal, but I was close. There were many a night where I actually sat up on the lighthouse in Newcastle on the edge of a cliff face drinking a bottle of alcohol, wondering how my life had deteriorated to this point. Um, it seemed hopeless. I couldn't see a way out, and yet there was a way out. But it's not just prodigal sons in this world. There are also many prodigal daughters, wonderful women made in the image of God who through a series of silly decisions or perhaps bad relationships find themselves in a position of despair, uh, a position of shame and guilt, wondering, how did I get here? And is there any possible way out? I think in ancient Middle East, the situation was far worse if you were a broken, despairing woman than if you were a broken, despairing man. Um, for a woman, it was particularly bad. Once you got to that stage, the situation really did look hopeless because it was kind of a men's world, a patriarchal society. But in a situation like this, Naomi, totally broken, totally beside herself, trusts in God's amazing love, heads for home, and actually experiences an, a redemption, a, a turnaround of her life far greater than she could possibly imagine. So my first point today I want to share with you is that Naomi herself was a prodigal daughter in a faraway land. Naomi was a prodigal daughter. Just have a look with me at Ruth chapter 1, reading from the first verse. Um, reading from the first verse, Ruth chapter 1. I hope you've got your Bibles open in front of you. Need to keep checking what the Bible says. So Ruth chapter 1, reading from verse 1. It says... In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Uh, the opening verses here really um, introduce us to the context of the book of Ruth. It tells us in the days of the judges. Now, if you can see it on the screen, you'll see that that was that period of time. What happened is Joshua led the Jews into the Promised Land around 1404 B.C., but shortly after leading the Jews into the Promised Land, he died. And then for a period of about 350 years, different judges ruled the Jewish people. Now, when you think judge, just think tribal leader or military leader. So they have all these different leaders until Israel eventually gets its first king, King Saul, around 1043 BC. So 
Ruth is in this period of the judges. They've just entered the promised land, but it's far from perfect. Um, Several points in the book of Judges and the very last verse in the book of Judges actually tell us this. Let me just show you on the screen. Um, It says that in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Um, Literally, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, just think about that for a moment. How does society actually go when everyone just does what they think is right in their own eyes? When there's no king, when there's no one upholding justice, and everyone just does what they think is best, how long does it take before life denigrates into complete anarchy? It's not very long, is it? And the book of Judges actually finishes with pictures of anarchy, 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 taking over Israel. I want to show you the overall story in the book of Judges so that you have the context of what's going on. If you look at the screen in front of you at the moment, you'll see that in each cycle in Judges, the Jews begin by agreeing to obey God. They say, yes, God is our God. We promise to obey him. But about three seconds later, we find them disobeying God. Sometimes it's idolatry, sometimes it's adultery. It, they're just disobeying God. And as a result, because they disobey God, they start to suffer the consequences. They start feeding the proverbial pigs, if you like. Now, sometimes it's famine, sometimes it's hostility from another nation, sometimes it's plague. They don't like the suffering, so what do they naturally do? The same as all of us when we're suffering, cry out to God, Lord, save me. I'm sorry, please save me. And so what God does in his grace and his mercy is he raises up a judge, a tribal leader of some sort who becomes the saviour of the people. He delivers the people. He brings order back to the Jewish people so society starts to work again. Everyone is happy and everyone agrees, yes, we promise we'll obey God this time for sure. Then the judge dies and it all starts all over again. And believe it or not, in the book of Judges, you go through this cycle seven times. Seven times. Now you think, how many times do you have to go through this cycle before you actually learn that doing what is right in your own eyes doesn't work? How many times do you have to actually go through that? But before we get too funny with the Jews we need to remember that this is actually the story of our human life. The book of Judges actually tells us that the human condition, once we have fallen, is so bad that no sooner does God get us out of trouble than we're creating another mess for ourselves to fall into. This is the human condition. And we need to remember, even as Christians, we have a predisposition towards this cycle. The minute we become proud, the minute we think we know better than God and we start doing what we think is right in our own eyes, we start falling into this cycle. What we need to remember is that as Christians, we're not meant to do what we think is right in our own eyes. We're actually meant to do what God says in the Bible. But here's the reality. Naomi Elimelech live in this period of time where everyone is doing what they think is fit in their own eyes, and Naomi and Elimelech are actually no better. They're doing exactly the same thing. Now, we're told in verse 1 that a famine came upon the land, and Elimelech and Naomi decided, okay, we'll move to Moab. It seems like a rational, logical decision. There's a famine in Bethlehem. It's really hard here. But over there in Moab, they seem all right. Everything seems to be working. So we will just move from Bethlehem to Moab. Seems like a great, logical decision. Let me just show you on the screen the move that they undertook. If you look at the map, you'll see that Naomi and Elimelech come from Bethlehem. Uh, It's right there. But what they do is they decide to go down to Moab, either that way around the Dead Sea or that way around the Dead Sea. Uh, Like I said, it seems like a reasonable, rational decision. 
But here's the problem. The Moabites were actually the descendants of Lot's incestuous relationship with his daughter. Uh, what's more, they worshipped a evil god called Kamosh, all sorts of evil practices. And what's more, as the Jews were approaching the promised land, the Moabites attacked them in a really fierce and nasty way and God actually told the Jews explicitly you're not to have anything to do with the Moabites until the 10th generation past the coming to the promised land. We're nowhere near the 10th generation of them entering the promised land and yet Ruth, uh, Naomi and Elimelech decide what could go wrong? Let's just go and live among the Moabites because hey it looks better down there. Does it ever actually work when we go against what God says? Uh, they get down to the Moab and they even go a step further. They end up giving their sons Marlon and Kilion in marriage to two Moabite women. Um, the Bible is very clear with the Jews, with Christians, that we should only marry fellow believers. It's got nothing to do with racial purity. It's got everything to do with spiritual purity. God knows that if we marry people who have different belief system, different religion to us, it compromises us spiritually. It makes us very hard for us to remain faithful to God. And so God put this restriction, Jews should only marry fellow Jews and converts to Judaism. But they go down there they give their sons in marriage to Moabite women. Again, let me just say that this seems rational, this seems logical. If you've read the end of the book of Judges, you'll see there is actually a wife shortage in Judah and Benjamin specifically. Because of a whole lot of things that was going on, there's not enough wives in Israel for the Israelite men. So naturally, Naomi, Elimelech go, well, there's not enough Suitable wives in Judah, we might as well just give Moabite women to our sons in marriage. Can you see how it's all rational? Can you see how it all can be justified one way or another? But here's the thing. Can we ever expect good results when we actually disobey God? And do we have any right to expect good outcomes when we go against his word? The answer is no. And when Naomi and Elimelech go to Moab against God's word, Elimelech ends up dying and Marlon and Kilion also end up dying. Now, you might think that's just a spot of bad luck. It's just coincidence. But in Jewish rabbinical tradition, they've always taught that this happened to Naomi and Elimelech because they broke God's word. It was God's discipline. It was God's punishment. What's more, as you read through chapter 1, Naomi herself says, the Lord Almighty has made my life bitter. Um, she seems to be acknowledging it's not just coincidence. It's not just bad luck. There are consequences of her actions that she acknowledges for herself. Um, Perhaps you're in a situation like that. You've made some decisions, you've gone against God's word, and you're finding yourself feeding the proverbial pigs. What do you do? Um, one of the things we need to realise is that when we go through suffering, when we go through difficulty, it is not always God's punishment. It's not always God's punishment. The Bible is more nuanced than that. The Bible actually teaches that sometimes... We can be doing the right thing. We can be righteous people of God and yet suffer because we live in a fallen, sinful world. But the Bible also teaches that if God's people intentionally break God's law, um, discipline, punishment, consequences will sometimes ensue to bring us back onto the right path. So in any point of suffering, in any point of difficulty, we need to stop and we need to make an evaluation. The evaluation is this. Am I simply suffering because I live in a fallen world, in which case I have to grin and bear it, or am I suffering right now because I've specifically disobeyed certain things God says, in which case I actually need to repent, change? Um, 
as Naomi does this self-examination, as she looks at the situation that has taken place, she realises the Lord has made her life bitter. As she has reaped the consequences of her, her actions, and she actually makes a choice. She makes a choice. I need to return to God. I need to get my life back on track with the God I know. And perhaps, like I said, that is something you need to do. Can you make that decision today to get your life back on track? You don't need to keep staying in the slops, feeding the proverbial pigs forever. It is possible to turn your life around. And so Ruth and Naomi, Naomi and Ruth, actually head, return to Bethlehem to kind of pursue God's love, to return to God's love. I want you to look with me. Just look with me again at the Bible, um, reading from verse 6. Verse 6. Uh, when Naomi, oh, hang on, sorry. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Uh, there's a key word in Ruth chapter 1, and it's the word return. It gets translated some different ways, but it happens 12 or 13 times in this chapter. And Naomi, after doing an assessment of her life, recognises she needs to return to God. Um, one of the best things when you realise your life is off track is to go back to the last point where it was actually on track. It's kind of the cardinal rule of bushwalking if you get lost. Go back to the last point where you know you're on track. And so Naomi, realising that her life has become a mess, decides to return to Bethlehem and to return to the God she knows. Um, perhaps that's a decision you need to make as well. Now, at first, Naomi is just kind of headed in the right direction with her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, in train or in tow um, behind her. It's actually a picture that is pretty depressing, pretty sad. There are three widows walking through the wilderness together. It's pretty broken. They've got nothing better to cling to than each other's brokenness. And so this is about as hopeless, about as despairing as you can possibly get. Um, and as they're heading there, Naomi starts to think, we all do this as we're heading home, Naomi starts to think, what sort of reception am I going to get when I get back to Bethlehem? How am I going to be received? You know, in some ways, Naomi has been a traitor to her people. She's gone and lived among the enemies. Uh, what's more, with the death of her husband and the death of her two sons, she has forfeited all her real estate and property rights in Jerusalem. She's got not very much to go back to at all. Uh, she's actually pretty stuffed. She's stuffed emotionally. She's distraught. She's stuffed spiritually because she's been apart from God, not going to the tabernacle, not offering sacrifices for sins, not participating in the Jewish festival. So she's stuffed spiritually. She's stuffed financially. And she even to an extent is stuffed reputationally because of the decisions she has made. Here is a really broken woman with not a lot going for her. Now, if you're anything like me, when you find yourself in these sort of positions, you begin by kind of wallowing in your sorrow for a little while. You sort of sit back and you kind of contemplate how deep the hole is that you've dug for yourself. And once you realise it's pretty bad, you then do the whole, woe is me, I think I'll go eat worms, and all of that happens. 
But after a period of time, you kind of get sick of eating worms, and so you start trying to find reasons for hope. You start trying to console yourself. And one of the things I do, I don't know about you, is I end up saying to myself, come on, Matt, pull it together. Your life is not as bad as fill in the blank. Do you ever do this? You know, you kind of, if you can find someone whose life is worse than yours, you kind of go, well, I'm not in such a bad situation. Maybe I should have a bit of hope. Now, I think that as Naomi's doing this, she's wandering through the desert, she's going, come on, Matt, Naomi, pull it together, pull it together, your life is not as bad as... She's thinking, who's my life not as bad as? And then her mind comes to rest on her two daughters-in-law who are following her through the wilderness. As bad as her situation is, the daughter-in-laws who are following her are in an even worse situation. They've forfeited all their real estate in Moab by marrying Jewish men who are now dead. They're following a Jewish widow through the wilderness to a country who considers them enemies. (laughs) They're actually more stuffed than the Christmas turkey. And at that point, Naomi, as she stops dwelling on herself and thinks of others, she realises the situation for her daughters-in-law is really bad. And she turns to them and she says, girls, what are you doing? What are you doing following me? I I can't protect you. I can't provide for you. I've got virtually nothing to return to myself. Why don't you just go home to Moab? Perhaps if you throw yourself on your family's mercy, perhaps someone there will look after you. Just, I can't look after you. I can't provide for you. Now, as Naomi says this to her daughters-in-law, Orpah kind of listens and decides, yes, I think you're right. What am I doing? I better head back to Moab. But it's interesting. Naomi uses a very interesting word if you look, second half of verse 8. It's almost a prayer for her daughters-in-law. In the end of verse 8, she says, May the Lord, Yahweh, show you kindness. Can you see that? Here's a two two daughter Moabites. May the Lord Yahweh show you kindness. The word here, is it still working all right? The word here for kindness is actually a Jewish word, hesed. Uh, It's a very important theological word and it kind of comes up in Ruth a little bit. And it means loving kindness, it means compassion, it means mercy, it means grace, it means the goodness of God. It's actually a word that is very hard to translate with one other word in English. But here's what Naomi could have prayed for her daughters. She could have prayed this, may the Lord smile upon you. That would capture the kind of idea. May the Lord smile upon you. But just pause with me for a second. Is that even possible? Can Yahweh the Jewish God smile upon incestuous, idolatrous Moabites? For the Jew, this is a radical thought. Could God actually smile upon, like the ironic high priestly prayer, a Moabite woman? Orpah pauses for a moment and decides, no, I'm going to head back to my own land. I'm going to go back and try and find mercy, try and find loving kindness there. But Ruth, Ruth looks at Naomi and says, no, your people are going to be my people and your God is going to be my God. Ruth takes a risk. We don't know exactly how much she knows about Yahweh yet, but she's seen something that makes her believe She has a better chance of finding this hesed love, this compassionate, loving kindness. She has a better chance of finding that in Bethlehem with Yahweh than she does in Moab with Kamosh. And so she takes a risk. She says, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I want to ask, is that a decision you've made? Have you decided, could you decide even with Ruth today, 
to make the God of the Bible your God, to make the people of the Bible your people. Um, These are the first good decisions we've heard in chapter 1. Naomi decides to return to where she went off track. Ruth decides, I'm going to go with her because I think I have a better chance of finding hesed love in Bethlehem than in Moab. Let's just look at the last point, because Naomi and Ruth actually find this hesed love in Bethlehem in a kinsman redeemer. Naomi and Ruth find this hesed love that's spoken about in Bethlehem in a kinsman redeemer. I want you to look with me from verse 11, if you all have verse 11. I'm just going to read a little bit, um, because it's actually talking here about a kinsman redeemer, although that word isn't used. Just look with me from verse 11. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? I am, going to have, am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And where I will be buried, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Um, When Naomi here talks about God's hesed, covenant love, we know that she still has a faith of sorts. And the very fact that Ruth uses God's personal name, Yahweh, in verse 17, shows that she too has some sort of personal knowledge of God. She actually covenants herself before God and says, may God deal with me ever so severely if I don't keep my word to this God. What we see is that Ruth and Naomi have a faith of sorts. Although Naomi and Elimelech have backslidden massively, Naomi still knows about God's has said covenant love. And Ruth decides that she's got a better chance of finding this has said love, knowing this has said love in Bethlehem rather than Moab. We don't know exactly how Ruth came to this knowledge, but despite all Elimelech and Naomi's failings, Ruth seems to have seen something different in them that she hasn't seen before. Yes, they've failed. Yes, they've stuffed up. Yes, they've made mistakes. But there is something in them, something they have that makes Ruth want to go with Naomi rather than return to her own people. She's seen something that is actually attractive in God's people, despite their flaws. Now, maybe you're a little bit like this. Maybe you're a non-Christian and you've been watching Christians for a while and you've noticed, yes, Christians do some pretty dumb and stupid things. Sometimes they're a little bit hypocritical because they are still sinners like Elimelech and Naomi. But as you've watched Christians, you've also noticed that they have something that is kind of attractive. Even in difficulties, even in crises like coronavirus, they have a faith. They have a hope. They have a love that is actually tangible and real and attractive. Uh, Perhaps you've seen this and you've been attracted to it. Could you today, like Ruth, actually make a decision? I want to find out more. I want to pursue this love. You see, if you listen very carefully, the Christians 
are actually praying for you the exact same thing that Naomi prayed for Ruth and Orpah. They're praying for you. May the Lord show you his loving kindness as revealed in Jesus. That's what they're praying. They're praying that you may know God's love for you, an amazing love and a hesed, merciful, compassionate, kind love that has been revealed in Jesus. That's their prayer. But at some point you have to make a decision. Will you find out about this love? Will you actually entrust yourself to this love? Will you decide to make God's people your people and the God of the Bible your God? If you make that decision, it's actually a really good decision. Ruth made this decision and she actually experienced God's has said love through a kinsman redeemer in a way that she couldn't imagine. If you look at the screen for a moment, I just want to share with you a technical word that's going to come up in Ruth uh, a little bit. Um, it's actually kinsman redeemer. The original Hebrew word was goel, and sometimes in the Bible it's translated kinsman redeemer. Sometimes in the Bible it's translated avenger of blood. But this role, this kinsman redeemer in the Bible has a special concern for widows. Uh, in the Old Testament, way before Jesus, God actually made laws that enabled someone else to save you when you couldn't save yourself. Let me just say that again. God made laws in the Old Testament that allowed a third party to save you when you couldn't save yourself. These were called the kinsman redeemer laws and the kinsman redeemer laws primarily applied to the firstborn son in each family the firstborn son had the responsibility of being the kinsman redeemer the kinsman his family's redeemer when they got themselves in trouble so imagine this you have a younger brother and he does dumb stuff and he gets himself so in debt that he has become a slave. If you are the firstborn, if you are the kinsman redeemer, it is your responsibility to pay the debt and set your brother free. What's more, if you have a younger sister who experiences some sort of injustice in her life, perhaps she's been raped. If you are the older brother, if you are the kinsman redeemer, it is your responsibility to pursue justice for your sister and, if necessary, even avenge her blood. Hmm. And more, if you are the oldest brother, you are the kinsman redeemer, and one of your younger brothers dies, leaving behind a widow with no one to look after her, you, the kinsman redeemer, have the responsibility to marry her, to provide for her, to protect her as your very own wife. These were the kinsman redeemer laws. They were actually designed to take care of you when you could no longer take care of yourself. Now, when Naomi talks in verse 11 and 12, um, saying to her daughter-in-law, look, I can't have any more sons, she's saying, I can't produce for you a kinsman redeemer. I can't actually provide you with a kinsman redeemer who will get your life out of the hole that has now been created. I, I just can't do it. There, there isn't a solution. And so she's appealing to the kinsman redeemer laws and they're going to come up again and again in the book of Ruth. That's what the focus is on. And the thing is, what Naomi could not provide for Ruth, God actually provided for Ruth in a man born in Bethlehem named Boaz. Yes, in this case, Boaz. Uh, Naomi couldn't provide a kinsman redeemer, but God provides a kinsman redeemer through a distant relative who actually takes on the role willingly to save Ruth and Naomi. This is an amazing story because when Boaz, the man born in Bethlehem, does this, 
he actually becomes a small picture of Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. He, Boaz is like Jesus, the ultimate kinsman redeemer. What Jesus does for us is that we've all run up a spiritual debt with God. We have this huge debt with God because of our sin that we cannot pay, and yet our kinsman redeemer, Jesus, the firstborn over all creation, he comes and he actually pays the debt for his brothers and sisters as he dies upon the cross. And then the kinsman redeemer, Jesus, actually sets us free from slavery to sin by giving us the Holy Spirit to live a new life. And more than that, one day Jesus, the kinsman redeemer, will actually return as the avenger of blood who seeks justice for his persecuted brothers and sisters in the world. And so Jesus becomes the kinsman redeemer we all need. But here's the thing. It's not just Gentiles like Ruth who need a kinsman redeemer. Jews like Naomi also need a kinsman redeemer because we have all fallen short of the standards of God. Um, the reality is the book of Ruth seems to focus on the Ruth Gentile and her redemption first, but ultimately the book finishes by focusing on Naomi's redemption at the end. It's like the redemption of the Gentiles and the redemption of the Jews are caught up together in some amazing way where both is actually necessary for one another to fulfill the purposes of God. As the book of Ruth finishes, I want to show you what the, the women in Bethlehem actually say to Naomi. Not to Ruth, but to Naomi. Let me just put this on the screen. The women said to Naomi, Ruth 4.14, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you, the Jew, without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. They actually say this to Naomi as she holds the baby born of Ruth and, Obed, uh, Ruth and Boaz. It's a baby named Obed. And as she's holding this baby, they say to her, God has provided for you this day a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. The thing is, her kinsman redeemer was not that baby Obed but a baby one day who would be born a descendant of Obed. His name was Jesus Christ. And he became not just the most famous Israelite to ever live, he became the most famous person in all the world. And God provided him. God provided him because we at the moment are in a position where we cannot save ourselves. But Jesus can. Jesus can save us because he died for our sin. He paid the penalty for us. He gives us the Holy Spirit to live for God. And one day he will come to bring justice to this world that we all desire. Do you know him? Is he your kinsman redeemer? As we work through the book of Ruth, I hope you come to a greater, better understanding of what Jesus has done for you, the big brother who looks out for you when you can't look out for yourself. Let me pray as we get into this great book. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that in your uh, sovereignty, Lord, your amazing power, you actually foretell in the Old Testament what Jesus would ultimately do for us. You actually create laws that become little pictures of our ultimate redemption. Lord, this is no accident. This is your sovereignty. This is your revelation showing us that Jesus isn't just an accident. He was planned before the creation of the world to save us from the sin that we can't save ourselves from. Please help us to trust in that love, that hesed love that you have revealed in Jesus, and so come home and receive all the blessings that you have to give. 
Lord, we commit this to you and we ask that we will truly trust in your son and not just do what is right in our own eyes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to read a little bit of Isaiah to you before we start to pray this morning as a reminder to ourselves of how wonderful and faithful God is as he was with Ruth and Naomi. So from Isaiah 25, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. In that day, you will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Let's join together in prayer now. We'll finish at the end with a prayer that we'll all pray for each other. But let's just close our eyes and pray now. Father, we give you thanks for your goodness and faithfulness to us, for providing all that we need, especially for saving us from our rebellion against you. So often we fail to live as you would have us live. So let us confess our personal failings to our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, you love us, but we do not love you as we should. You call, but we do not always listen. We often walk away from our neighbours in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We often condone evil, hatred, warfare and greed. God of grace, Help us to admit our sin so that you may move towards us in mercy. We may repent and turn back to you and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our, our Redeemer. We pray for the civil unrest in the Middle East countries, for the families of the 42 who lost their lives in the Afrin truck bombing this week. We pray for the people of North Korea, through this time of uncertainty of who will lead their country if Kim Jong-un is no longer able to. We pray that you will raise up a leader whose concern is for the people and their care. Let us ask God to help us during this pandemic. We pray for those around the world who currently have coronavirus, Lord. We humbly ask for your healing hand to be over them. We pray that through this illness they might come to trust you and commit their lives to you. We also bring to you those who have lost loved ones in the, with, to this virus. Place your loving arms around them and give them comfort. For the, Father, we ask for your hand to protect our friends and family in other lands, especially those in places where the numbers affected by coronavirus are growing or where governments don't have the resources to provide testing and adequate treat, treatment for those who are ill. Give us comfort, Lord, in the knowledge that even in this situation, you are still in control. We give you thanks for the government leaders in our country who have put in place measures to bring this virus under control. We pray for our leaders who must be weary and tired. Please give them strength and wisdom to continue to lead us. We also pray that as the restrictions are lifted, that people might continue to act in a manner that protects others and themselves from succumbing to the virus. We are thankful, Lord, that we are now reconnecting with family and friends. We continue to bring before you health workers known to us. We pray from your, for your continued protection for them and ask that you give them wisdom in how to treat this disease and strength to carry on in their work when it is overwhelming and help those who are trying to develop a vaccine to find one for us all. Lord, help us not to be so consumed with COVID-19 that we overlook other areas of need. We pray for the homeless, for those who grieve for other reasons, those dealing with addictions, unemployment, relationship breakdowns and mental health issues. Lord, we know that you are aware of all these needs 
Help us to be a source of love and care for all in need. We thank you for those who serve you overseas, particularly for our missionaries. We give you thanks for supplying Matt and Jen with a better house for their family and for keeping them safe during this time. We also thank you that Via Rica has been able to connect with us for church on Facebook and, and that you will continue to give her the strength for the work that you have to do for her to do and for her health. We commit Laura and her daughter into your care. Please provide a long-term safe place for them to live. And we thank you for providing the right medication that is helping her and people also to assist her while she's and, and the care of her child. We ask you to give wisdom to Via Rica in her direction in ministry with the women of Athens. Let us now all join together in prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ in the words of Paul from Ephesians. Praying together. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of our heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and the incomparably great power for us who believe. Amen. Uh, what a great uh, passage to look at today as we remember uh, that even in the beginning before Jesus came, uh, he, was being, um, he was expected as the kinsman redeemer. Um, I wonder how that, uh, pass uh, how that message got to you and maybe you uh, don't know where you stand and I would encourage you to really think, um, is Jesus your kinsman redeemer? And if you've made that decision today that he is, uh, please contact us. We would love to hear from you. Uh, it's also great as we sing our final song that we remember this has been planned uh, for a long time as we sing about uh, God's uh, unfailing and faithful power with the song forever.
thanks for joining us uh, today as we uh, started our series on Ruth. It's been great to have you. Please uh, stay around now and join us online uh, for morning tea. And I'd encourage to, you to get online and we'll see you at Community Group on Thursdays. Uh, it's been great having you and uh, we will close this time uh, with the grace. Uh, let's say it together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. See you next week.